Hello everyone. Today's lecture will be on cavernous sinus thrombosis. The learning outcome from this lecture is to comprehend the anatomy and venous connection and to explain the danger area of the face, to discuss the mechanism of spread of infection from the face, the etiology and the clinical features of sinus thrombosis, and to point out the complication and management of cavernous sinus so what is cavernous sinus thrombosis? Cavernous sinus thrombosis is a rare, life-threatening disorder that can complicate facial infection, sinusitis, orbital cellulitis, or following traumatic injury or surgery, especially in the setting of a thrombophilic disorder. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is a serious condition. It causes death in up to 30% of cases. So early recognition of cavernous sinus thrombosis is critical for a good outcome. Despite modern treatment with antibiotics and anticoagulation, the risk of long-term sequelae such as vision, diplopia, and stroke remains significant. Cavernous sinus thrombosis involves the formation of a thrombus within the cavernous sinus, which can either be septic or aseptic. Septic cavernous sinus thrombosis is a rapidly evolving thrombophilic process with an infectious origin, typically from the middle third of the face, affecting the cavernous sinus and its structure. A septic cavernous sinus thrombosis is usually a thrombotic process that is a result of trauma, hydrogenic injuries, or prothrombotic conditions. Epidemiology. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is so rare that incident data is difficult to estimate. Cavernous sinus thrombosis comprises approximately 1-4% to of cerebral venous and sinus thrombosis. Incident is approximately between 0.2 to 1.6 per 100,000 cases per year. A male or female predominance in cavernous sinus thrombosis is uncertain. Uh, it is more common in children and neonates than in adults. Uh, and the incident and mortality may be decreasing likely due to availability and use of antibiotics. The etiology of cavernous sinus thrombosis. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is usually septic, but it can also be aseptic. Septic causes, for example, facial abscess or cellulitis. Uh, sinusitis, especially involving the spinoid and ethmoidal sinus. Odontogenic origin, especially from the upper jaw region. Uh, uh, decay tooth or infection from uh, tooth of the upper jaw can lead to the uh, can lead to the process of prominent sinus thrombosis. The other septic cause is maxillofacial surgery, otitis media, and mastoiditis. A septic cause of cavernous sinus thrombosis is less common. Uh, this involves trauma, surgery, or pregnancy. Odontogenic sources have been reported to be responsible for up to 10% of cases. The most commonly isolated organisms are Staphylococcus aureus, which contributed about 70% of all cases, and Streptococcus species, which uh, accounts for about 20% of all the cases. Other organisms involved include Pneumococcus, Bacteroids, Fusobacterium, Proteus, Haemophilus, Pseudomonas, and Corinibacterium. So, bacteria stimulate the formation of a thrombus by the release of a pro-coagulative substance and through toxins that cause tissue damage. So what are the risk factors for, for cavernous sinus thrombosis? The risk factor includes immuno, uh, those with immunosuppression, for example, patients with uncontrolled diabetes, uh, long-term steroid use, cancer patient, or patients under chemotherapy. Facial infection, acute sinusitis, and periorbital infection are also uh, the risk factor for cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, pregnancy, postpartum, those receiving oral contraceptives, or those on hormone replacement therapy are also at risk. 
A patient with thromophilic genetic disorder, for example, those with protein C or S deficiency, or those with increased factor 8, are also at risk. The other risk factor is those patients with acquired disorders such as antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or those with heparin-induced thromocytopenia. Obesity and severe dehydration are the other uh, risk factors for cavernous sinus thrombosis. Now let's look at the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus are located within the middle cranial fossa on either side of the cella thoracica of the spinot of the spinot bone, which contain the pituitary gland. They are enclosed by the endosteel and meningeal layers of the dura mater. So this is the cross section of the cavernous sinus. Here we can see the right and left cavernous sinuses are located on either side of the spinoid spinoid sinus. And here we can see the right and left cavernous sinus are connected by the intercavernous sinus. And uh, there are a number of important structures inside the cavernous sinus. For example, we have the oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic nerve, abducens nerve, maxillary nerve, and also internal carotid artery. Okay, this diagram is to show the danger triangle of the face or the danger zone of the face yeah, which consists of the area from the corner of the mouth to the bridge of the nose to the bridge of the nose so infection from this particular area can have a direct communication to the cavernous sinus area so what are the borders of cavernous sinus anteriorly the border is made up of superior orbital fissure the petrous part of the temporal bone form the posterior border. The medial border is made, uh, is made up of the body of the spinoid bone. Okay. The lateral body uh, is made up of meningeal layer of the dura mater, which running from the roof to the floor of the middle cranial fossa. Okay. The meningeal layer of the dura mater that attached to the anterior and medial cranoid process of the spinoid bone forms the roof of the cavernous sinus and the floor is formed by the endosteel layer of dura mater that overlies the base of the greater wing of the spinoid bone. So there are several important structures that pass, passes through the cavernous sinus to enter the orbit. These can be subclassified by whether they travel through the sinus itself or through its lateral wall. So those structures that travel through the cavernous sinuses are abducens nerve, uh, cranial nerve number 6, the carotid pulse, uh, which is the post-gangronic sympathetic nerve fibers, and the internal carotid artery. Those structures that travel through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus includes oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number 3, trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number 4, uh, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. So here we can see those structures that travels through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Eh? The three, the three, four, the three, four, and five uh, cranial nerve. Uh, three, four, and five cranial nerve. And those that travel through the cavernous sinus, uh, for example, the internal carotid artery and the six cranial nerve. The cavernous sinus is the only site in the body where an artery, which is the internal carotid artery, passes completely through a venous structure. So this is thought to allow for heat exchange between the warm arterial blood and the cooler venous circulation. To remember all this structure, we can use this old tomcat mnemonic. Old tomcat mnemonic. So the otom, O-T-O-M, refers to oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic branch, and maxillary branch. And this refers to low structure to the, to the lateral wall content from superior to inferior. And 
CAT or CAT pneumonia stands for internal carotid artery, abducens nerve, and trochlear nerve. And this refers to the horizontal content from medial to lateral. So now we, we look at the dural venous sinus system. Each cavernous sinus receives venous drainage from a number of sinuses. The ophthalmic vein, the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein, uh, drains into the cavernous sinus. drains into the cavernous sinus. So this enters the cavernous sinus via the superior orbital fissure. The central vein of the retina also drains into the cavernous sinus. It drains into the superior ophthalmic vein or directly into the cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus uh, also receive venous drainage from the spinoparietal sinus, which empty into the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus. The superior superficial middle cerebral vein, cerebral vein also drain into the cavernous sinus. This contribute to the venous drainage of the cerebrum. And uh, cavernous sinus also receive venous drainage from the trigoid venous plexus. It is important to note that the superior ophthalmic vein forms an anastomosis with the facial vein. Therefore, the ophthalmic veins represent a potential route by which infection can spread from an extracranial to an intracranial site. For example, any infection from, uh, from decayed prim upper primola or molar or, canine, or upper canine can lead uh, can lead to the cavernous sinus via this uh, passage. So the cavernous sinus empty into the superior and inferior petrosal, petrosal sinuses and ultimately into the internal jugular vein. The left and right cavernous sinuses are connected in the midline by the anterior and posterior intercavernous sinuses. So they travel through the cella toxica of the sphenoid tube. So this is to show the dural venous system relating to the cavernous sinus. So note that the anastomosis uh, between the ophthalmic vein and the facial vein. Uh, anastomosis between the facial vein and the ophthalmic vein, which later drain have a direct communication with the cavernous sinus. So any infection from the middle uh, from the middle part of the face uh, can travel uh, through these uh, passages to the cavernous sinus. So as mentioned before, spread of infection from the danger area of the face, uh, danger, danger area of the face can lead to thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. So the cavernous sinus communicate with the danger area of the face through two routes, the superior ophthalmic vein and the deep facial vein, trigger venous plexus and the emissary vein. This is the uh, sagittal section of the head. Uh, which shows the connection of the facial vein, the ophthalmic vein, and the trigger venous plexus, uh, which have a direct communication with the cavernous sinus. Patient with cavernous sinus thrombosis will be presented with unilateral retroorbital pain, periorbital edema, ophthalmoplegia, proptosis, chemosis, Ptosis, exophthalmus, dipropia, and spiking temperature. So here we can see how the eye look very proptose, uh, very proptose, and exophthalmus. And this is the axial view of the CT scan, which shows an acute inflammatory process, which result in the periorbital edema of the affected region. Now let's look at the pathophysiology. Infection from the affected area, such as the danger zone of the face, can lead to embolization of bacteria and other infectious organisms, which later trigger thrombosis, which then can trap infection within the cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus thrombosis leads to decreased drainage from the facial vein and superior and inferior ophthalmic veins, resulting in facial and periorbital edema, ptosis, proptosis, chemosis, discomfort, and pain with eye muscle movement, papilloedema, 
retinal venous dissection and loss of vision. Lack of valve in the dural sinus system allows flow through the emissary veins into and out of the cavernous sinus and thrombos can propagate into the dural system. And the communication between the right and left cavernous sinus via the intercavernous sinuses allows the spread of thrombus and infection from one side to the other. Local compression and inflammation of cranial nerve can lead to severe, several partial or complete cranial neuropathies. Diplopia, from, diplopia result from partial or complete external op ophthalmoplegia due to compression of the 6th, 3rd and 4th cranial nerve. Internal ophthalmoplegia, which is non-reactive pupil, occurs from loss of sympathetic fibers from the short ciliary nerve. This results in meiosis and from loss of parasympathetic fibers from, from oculomotor nerve, which results in mydrasis. Paresthesia around the eyes and forehead and loss of corneal reflex is and loss of corneal reflex is, is due to the injury to the ophthalmic nerve. Facial pain, paresthesia, or numbness can also result from compression of the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Septic cavernous sinus thrombosis can result in the central nervous system or infectious pulmonary complication. Dural venous and cavernous system is problems. So, venous blood can communicate with dural sinuses and cerebral and emissary vein, leading to meningitis, dural emphema, or brain abscess. Infection can spread via the jugular vein to the pulmonary vasculature, resulting in septic emboli or abscess, pneumonia, or emphema. Stroke can occur following carotid artery narrowing, vasculitis, or hemorrhagic infarction following progression to cortical vein thrombosis. And hypopituitarism can occur due to ischemia or the direct spread of infection. Diagnosis of cavernous sinus thrombosis. CT scan and MRI are the diagnostic modality of choice for cavernous sinus thrombosis. CT scan of the head, although it is not ideal for a cavernous sinus thrombosis diagnosis, may reveal several subtle abnormalities such as engorgement or dilation of the superior and, in, and or inferior ophthalmic vein, bulging of the lateral margin of the cavernous sinus, it can also show exophthalmus and possibly the presence of spinoid or ethmoid sinusitis. And it can also show presence of mass lesion near the spinoid or pituitary gland. Contrast enhanced MRI brain can show bulging of the cavernous sinus, increased dural enhancement, and absent flow void. MRI is useful when CT images are not clear or when the infection has spread to the surrounding tissues, including the brain and pituitary gland. So what is the treatment for cavernous sinus thrombosis? Appropriate therapy should take into account the primary source of infection, as well as possible associated complications such as brain abscess, meningitis, or subdural emphema. Surgical intervention should be directed at the primary source of the infection and the surrounding areas of involvement. Incision and drainage of the involved sites should be accomplished as soon as possible. Emergent surgical drainage with spinoid, spinoid Spinoidotomy is indicated if the primary site of infection is believed to be the spinoid sinus. The mainstay of therapy for cavernous sinus thrombosis is early and aggressive antibiotic administration. 
we can use cephalosporin, chloramphenicol, and metronidazole. Broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics are used as empiric therapy until a definite pathogen is found. Steroids have a controversial role in the management of carbonous sinus thrombosis. The benefits of decreasing orbital inflammation, cranial nerve edema, and intracerebral hemorrhage must be weighed against the potential immunosuppressive effects and possible prothrombotic properties. Steroid therapy can be used to reduce cranial nerve dysfunction or when progression to pituitary insufficiency occurs. Corticosteroid should only be instituted after appropriate antibiotic coverage has started. That's been said. Anticoagulation with heparin after anticoagulation with heparin can only be indicated after the diagnosis is confirmed. The benefit is the the benefit of anticoagulation is the cessation of progression of the thrombus in the septic carbonous sinus thrombosis. Bacteria may reside within a thrombus for a period for a period of time until canalization of the thrombus occurs. This allows for the penetration of antibiotics. So what is the complication of carbonous sinus thrombosis? Since the dural venous and carbonous system are bubbles, communication between dural sinuses and cerebral and emissary vein can lead to meningitis, dural emphema or cerebral abscess. Propagation of infection via the internal jugular vein can also result in septic pulmonary emboli, pulmonary abscess, pneumonia or emphema. Compression of internal carotid artery and pituitary gland may result in stroke and hypopituitarism respectively. And the ultimate complication of carbonous sinus thrombosis is death. So prognosis of carbonous sinus thrombosis. Before antibiotics were developed, the mortality rate of carbonous sinus thrombosis was almost 100%. The development of antibiotics has decreased the mortality of cavernous sinus thrombosis. However, the mortality rate is still relatively high at 14% to 30%. Cavernous sinus thrombosis requires early diagnosis and proper treatment. Even after treatment, cranial nerve dysfunction may remain and intracavernous aneurysm may also occur. Therefore, Long-term patient follow-up is very important for cavernous sinus thrombosis. So with that, I end my lecture. Thank you very much.